And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Open your Bibles with me to the Old Testament prophecy of Habakkuk. Habakkuk is on page 132 <laughs> in the Old Testament, right after the book of Nahum. Use the table of contents. Habakkuk at chapter 1, verses 1 through 11, and I want to preach through this book from this subject, from fear to faith. From fear to faith. The oracle that the prophet Habakkuk saw. O oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? and you will not listen or cry to you violence and you will not save why do you make me see wrongdoing and look at trouble destruction and violence are before me strife and contention arise so the law becomes slack and justice never prevails the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, judgment comes forth perverted. Look at the nations and see. This is the Lord talking to Habakkuk. Look at the nations and see. Be astonished. Be astonished for a work is being done in your days that you would not believe if you were told. For I am rousing the Chaldeans that fierce and impetuous nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. Dread and fearsome are they. Their justice and dignity, dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more menacing than wolves at dusk. Their horses charge. Their horsemen come from far away. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. They will come for violence with faces pressing forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff, and of rulers they make sport. They laugh at every fortress and heap up earth to take it. Verse 11 reads, then they sweep by like the wind. They transgress and become guilty. Their own might is their God. Thank you. You may be seated. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. From fear to faith. The book of Habakkuk, the Old Testament prophecy of Habakkuk, is called an oracle. The word oracle means burden. Habakkuk is burdened. The conversations that constitute the book are remarkable for their length and progression of thought. Habakkuk's reaction to the response and his rephrasing to the question that he asks God is that God's response to him is surprising. He is not expecting God to say what God is getting ready to say. Habakkuk's faithful incredulity is common to our humanity and to the hopes of everybody who is a person of faith. Habakkuk was a contemporary of Nahum, Zephaniah, and Jeremiah. The book was written against a backdrop of apostasy. 
judgment and unbelievable hardship during the time when King Jehoiakim of Judah, who was a vassal of Nebuchadnezzar, led the people back into idolatry and away from the worship of the living God. Idolatry is not just the worship of false gods, it is also worshiping the true God falsely. God is preparing to judge the nation and Habakkuk is having trouble understanding why God would use a heathen nation like Babylon to judge his people Israel. Habakkuk prophesied in the midst of violent political upheaval. The subject matter of the book covers 66 years in 56 verses. His humanity and joy are a model and a challenge for people of faith even today. The result is a book that is a timeless witness to God's purposes in a world dominated by corruption and violence. Like Job, Habakkuk argues his case, but in the end he realizes that God is not to be worshiped merely because of the temporal, material, and physical blessings of life, but God is to be worshiped for who he is. The country was on the brink of a devastating invasion. Famine threatened. Violence and social injustice filled the land. And Habakkuk had every reason to sink in despair because the question suspended in the air was and is where is God in these turbulent times? But brothers and sisters, if you haven't hung up on me yet, the name Habakkuk means embrace, especially as a means of keeping warm when there is no other shelter. God embraces his questions and in so doing, God embraces Habakkuk. The parallels between the message of Habakkuk and this crisis-ridden world that we live in today are powerfully relevant to our time. Habakkuk reminds the true believer that no event, however catastrophic, fails to find a place in God's loving purpose for humanity. In the midst of enormous personal upheaval and, and emotional strain, like the prophet Habakkuk, we can shout, thank God, anyhow. If we learn to live in the, in the divine parenthesis of although and yet. Although God has not delivered, yet I will rejoice. Although God has not answered my prayer, yet I'm going to go to church. Although God has not always revealed his plans for me, yet I'm going to glorify him anyway. Although it seems to be raining in my life, yet I will hide under the shelter of God's protection because God is a very present help in the time of trouble. Habakkuk receives the oracle in the temple in Jerusalem 
where he is a prophet musician uh, during a time of violent national and international strife. In verse 3, Habakkuk wants to know why he and God must continue tolerating six problems. Six problems. Injustice. Wrongful suffering. Destruction. Violence. Strife. And conflict. The law is paralyzed. Justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous. And because of the aforementioned, justice is perverted. The corruption of national politics is the historical context of Habakkuk's time and our time. And straight from this morning's news, tens of thousands of Israelis rally in Tel Aviv demanding the release of hostages. Abortion battles are surging around the nation because of an embattled Supreme Court. Criminal justice reform and voter suppression in states across the nation are coming to the boiling point. Elderly people are being attacked in the streets. Donald Trump is four times indicted with 91 counts for crimes that have nothing to do with President Biden and his administration, yet he has the temerity to carry on calling himself Nelson Mandela. There is a crisis at the border, failures in public education, and the Powerball, we don't even know what the numbers are right now. I, I just threw that in. I, I'm kidding about that. Erase that. I, did, I didn't mean to put that in there. But the commandment, come on, get your mind back on, on, on what I'm talking about. <laughs> the commandment, do not be afraid, fear not, occurs 27 times in the New Testament. It is arguable that fear is the great enemy of faith because it inhibits, it inhibits our confidence and trust in God who cares for us in Christ who is ever at our side and in the Holy Spirit who infuses us with a spirit of boldness. Take this home with you. 95% of the things we fear never come to pass. 95% of the things we worry about and stay up all night about will never happen. It is the devil causing us to fear that God will not be able to take care of us. But some of us here have lived long enough to testify. I've been young. I wish I had a Bible reader. And now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsake. I wish I had a witness. No, his seed begging bread. God will not only take care of you, he'll take care of your children. He'll take care of your grandchildren. I will keep him in perfect peace. If you keep your mind, have I got a witness here? God will make a way out of nowhere. God will deliver you if you call him. Our elders used to say, if you pray and pray right. Yeah, some of y'all was raised like I was raised. 
God will hear and answer your prayer. God will come in the room where you are and make a way out of no way. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to move. I'm trying to move through this little word. But I mentioned to the people who were here in our early service that yesterday a brother... Um, Wellington Armelin, who was over the lights and camera and sound here at the church, Brother Wellington Armelin mentioned to me uh, this morning, came to the study and mentioned to me, Reverend, I want to talk to you. He said, I want to have a word with you, but we can do it later. I said, no, just, just, just give it to me now. He said, you were at the gas station yesterday over at the Chevron station on Old Spanish Trail. And he said, I was across the street at the Exxon station. And he said, you were putting gas in your car and you were leaning on the side and you were not paying attention. He said, there was a man behind you with a hoodie on taking your picture. He said, you went in the gas station and came out and he went in at the same time, almost the same time you did and came out. He said, I was watching, I was paying attention. I was fitting to go across there, but you came out and got in your car and left. He said, I'm saying that to you to ask you to be aware of your surrounding. And I thought about that. There was a man behind me. But there was another man above me. All night, all day, have I got a witness here? God will keep you. God will watch over you. God will make a way for you. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked I wish I had somebody to help me. Even my enemies and my foes came upon me at the gas station. They stumbled and they fell. Though a whole shit encamp against me, in this will I be confident. One thing, come on, you can help me say it. Have I desired of the Lord and that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all my days for in the time of trouble he shall won't he do it? Won't he do it? Tell somebody next to you God will keep you. He's a keeper. He's a deliverer. Uh, be not dismayed. What whatever be taught. God will. Yes, he will. God will take care of you. The sun shall not smite you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. He shall preserve you going out and you're coming in from this time forth and even the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake, yay! I wish I had some help here. Though I walk through the valley of the very shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for God is with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil so that my cup is just running over. Surely, goodness and mercy 
shall follow me all the days of my life. And when I'm gone from this world, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me, let me try to say a word to those who believe that you cannot question God. Let me say a word to you who have been taught like I was taught that you cannot question God. However, questions and lament are a part of a believer's burden. An honest dialogue with God is necessary to form a strong relationship. Questions and lamentations are God's gift to the believer. They provide a pathway to honest faith and faithful conversation with him in turbulent times. The message of the book of Habakkuk, brothers and sisters, is, is sorely needed in these days when so many of us are perplexed by the problem of history. But if the believer can trust in God's providence, he, and she, he or she can gain wonderful insight into biblical philosophy and biblical history and how these things are going to be reconciled in his own holiness and in his own greatness and how everything will eventually work out for our good and his glory. I want you to see something in this text. That God's ways are often mysterious. God may seem to be strangely silent and strangely inactive in the most provocative of circumstances. You, you would think God would make himself known on September 11th. You, you would think God would, would show his face in that calamitous situation over in Israel. You would think God would make his voice known in the earthquake that just happened on the East Coast. Earthquakes take place on the West Coast, but there was an earthquake this past week on the East Coast. You would think God would show up in the violence in our streets, in this abortion issue, with Trump delaying his trials and, and not ever seeming to go to jail for what would have sent Obama under the jail for. You would think God would be speaking in these provocative times. Well, he is. But we are not listening to God. Because every event that has taken place is God saying, watch it. Pay attention. Open your eyes. The end is coming. And if you're not ready when it comes, I have warned you. And then, sometimes God gives unexpected answers. The least thing we would expect God to do is what God does to answer our prayer. He will send an enemy to make us stronger. He will send sickness to draw us closer. He will
will send heartbreak to make us focus because sometimes we are all over the place and when you're all over the place and you're not focused God has to send something in your life to pull you back to where he wants you to be in the book of James it's called dipsychosis. That's the Greek word, dipsychosis. It's a Greek word for double-minded. Dipsychosis. Dipsychosis means you have two souls. It's two things warring on the inside of you. Your flesh and your spirit. And if you are honest, more often than not, your flesh wins over your spirit. I, I, need, I need somebody who can help me here. Uh, well, well, no, I don't need your help. Let me call somebody who wrote the scripture. The apostle Paul himself. Paul said, every time I desire to do good, evil is always present. The good that I would do, I find myself not doing. And the evil that I don't want to do, that's what I do. Oh, wretched man, not that I was, but that I still am. There's a war going on in my members. My flesh is against my spirit. And I try to put on the whole armor of God, but some days it falls off. I'm not talking to you holy folk in here. I'm not talking to you who never made a mistake. I'm not talking to you who don't have anything to repent for. I'm not talking to you who, like Donald Trump says, I don't need to ask God for forgiveness. I need to ask God for forgiveness. I need God to cover me. I need God to shield me. I need God to keep me from the devil. Mm. And sometimes he sends the person you least expect. Or he sends the situation that you least was looking for. And then sometimes God uses strange instruments to correct his church and correct his people. I hope that this does not come true. But I would not be surprised if God does not use this fool Donald Trump to discipline America. because we've gotten comfortable in our sin. This ain't no Christian nation. The founders of this nation were not Christians, they were slave owners. America is not a country, America is an idea. I-D-E-A, an idea in democracy that could or could not work because a democracy is only yours if you can keep it. And you can only keep it by being right with your brothers and sisters, by loving your neighbor as you love yourself, by loving God with your whole heart and with your whole mind and with your whole strength and your neighbor like you love yourself. In the founding documents of this nation are the words we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights, which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of, the very people who wrote that, owned people. In the Constitution right now, blacks are three-fifths of a human. See how quiet you got right there? Because brothers and sisters, history does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. I said it does not repeat itself, but it rhymes. Because the same thing that happened in Jim Crow America is going on in America in 2024. 
They are trying to keep us from voting because if you vote, you have a voice. And if you have a voice, you have value because you are created in the image and the likeness of God. And if you don't exercise your constitutional right, you are making them right. God is mysterious in that he may use our enemy to bring us to our knees. That's what God did with Israel with Nebuchadnezzar. God blessed them, brought them out of Egypt with a strong arm and an outstretched hand. Their clothes would not wear out. When they got hungry, he fed them. When they got thirsty, he gave them sweet water to drink. Everything they needed, God provided. And then they forgot the God who brought them. Right after Moses told them, you're going to come to houses that you didn't build, vineyards that you have not planted, you will come to streams and fountains that you have not dug. It's when you get full that you forget the God who brought you. They went through the judges. They went through the kings. And then God brings them to Babylon. And there they sit down by the river of Babylon. And in Psalm 137, they say, by the river of Babylon, there we, we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For they that carried us away captive required of us mirth. And they that wasted us required of us a song, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. But how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? They are in Babylon now because they've disobeyed God. But God still has a remnant. You're going to help me preach this, won't you? God still got a few people in Babylon who have not yet bowed their knee to Baal. And so Nebuchadnezzar builds this golden image on the plains of Dura and he says when the music sounds, everybody bow and worship this golden image. The music started and everybody bowed but Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. They went and told the king, you said that these men that you put over us, that when the music starts, they ought to bow. The music started and they did not bow. And the king called them in and said, boys, maybe y'all didn't get my email. Maybe y'all didn't understand my text. So let me run it by you one more time. When the music starts, everybody bow and worship this image or you will be cast immediately into a burning fiery furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, King, we don't need no meeting. We don't have to elect any officers. We don't need to caucus about this. We've already made up our mind that the God we serve is able and he will deliver us out of your hand. But if not, if he chooses not to deliver us, we are still not going to buy. The king got so angry, he heated the fire seven times hotter than it was normally heated, put on some wool caps and blankets and bound their wrists and ankles, threw them in the midst of the burning fire, sat down and looked back in. And when he looked in, he said to his boys, didn't we throw three men bound in the fire? They said, yes, we did, old king. He said, well, I see four men loose walking around in the fire. They brought him out and they didn't even smell burned because if you trust God, he'll lower the temperature in your fiery furnace. If you trust God, 
up, he'll steal the appetite of a lion in your lion's den. I need somebody here who has determined that I'm going with Jesus no matter who gets in my way, no matter who stands up against me, I'm going to church. Company, you come to my house, bring you some church clothes because everybody in this house on Sunday morning is going to church. God has opened too many doors. God has made too many ways. God has paid too many bills. God has answered too many prayers. God has dried too many tears. God has solved too many problems. God has lifted too many burdens. God has made so many ways that I'm not going to let anybody stop me from giving God praise. Maybe you're the only one on your pew. Maybe you're the only one in your section got something to thank God for. Tell your neighbor, excuse me a minute. I got to take a second or two right now to tell God thank you for what you've already done. I'm looking for a miracle. I'm looking for a breakthrough. I'm looking for an answer. And I need God to come right away. So if I'm bothering you, you might want to go sit somewhere else. Because you don't know like I know. You can't tell it like I can tell it. What God has done and what I'm looking for God to do. He's mysterious. Uh, God's ways. God's ways are not only mysterious, but God's ways are often misunderstood. They are misunderstood by careless believers. Careless believers. Let me, let, me, let me say this to you, and I want you to write this in your heart or write it down, put it on your phone, wherever you can get it. Get this. God will make your enemies feed you. And they will think that they are undermining you. But God will use them to bless you. Because he does not always change the situation. Sometimes he changes you in the midst of that situation so that at some point the situation ain't gonna bother you. And then you will grow in your faith and mature in your walk with God and you'll get to the point where you'll say, now you know I, I, I used to would have cussed somebody out about this. But I'm growing in my faith. I'm maturing in my walk with God. And so all I'm going to say to you right now is, boy, bye. Girl, you better move around. Because I'm spiritual right now. God got my tongue right now. God keeping my fist from balling up right now. But that was a time when it wouldn't have been a right now. It'd have been on like Donkey Kong in here. But when you start growing up in your faith, silly people don't make you come down to their level. Foolish people don't make you respond to their ignorance. Sinful people don't make you react to their craziness. If God be for us, somebody ought to help me preach here. Who can be against us? God 
will make a way out of nowhere. Hear me. I'm through. It looks like the world is going to hell in a handbasket. Everything is going haywire. You can't tell if a boy is a boy or a girl is a girl. Same-sex unions. Trouble in our homes. Rape and murder on our streets. There's, there's no newscast that does not lead without blood. Hatred and strife is all around us. And it seems like the devil is in control. But I've got some good news. Satan may be in control, but God is in charge. And since God is in charge, don't worry about your enemy. Don't worry about the mess that's going on in your neighborhood. Go home and sleep this afternoon. Get you a good meal and lay down and take a good Sunday after church nap. Recognizing that no matter what tomorrow brings, God has already lived in Monday. God has already gone before you. God has already worked it out for you. He's just waiting for you to get to the blessing that he has for you. But you've got to be patient and recognize that there might be some trouble you have to go through to get there. But if you trust God, it may be Friday in your life, but Sunday morning is coming. I said it may be Friday, but Sunday is coming. It looked pretty dark one Friday. It looked pretty dismal one Friday because they took my Lord and they nailed him to a cross. They, ho they hoisted him in the air between two criminals and it looked pretty dark one Friday everybody wagged their heads on Friday everybody hung their heads on Friday everybody's countenance fell on Friday because Friday looked real dark it was real silent all day Saturday Saturday afternoon looked real dismal all Saturday evening all they could do was bow their heads but somewhere between Saturday night and early Sunday morning a transformation took place early Sunday morning God did a new thing he brought Jesus alive from the grave and whatever is dead in your life today God has the power to resurrect it whatever is falling apart in your life today God has the strength to put it all together again whatever looks all wrecked in your life right now God can straighten it up for you because there are some witnesses all over this sanctuary who can help me testify this morning I was down but he picked me up I was sick but he healed my body I was lost but he came and found me I was on my way to hell but he turned me all around is there anybody here had a problem God solved is there anybody here had a burden God lifted anybody here had a way God made anybody here had a mountain God brought you over if you're not too mean this morning if you don't mind testifying if you don't care who's looking at you help me be a witness this morning God will make a way God will answer prayer God will turn it around won't he do it 
won't he do it? If he brought you and you don't care who's standing by you, if he made a way for you and you don't mind waving your hands, if he put food on your table, clothes on your back, if he paid your bills for you, if he made your enemy your footstool, if he set joy bells ringing, if he dried your tears, if he made your heart happy, why don't you tell somebody it was nobody but Jesus. It was nobody but Jesus. If you know him and you're not ashamed to testify, come on, tell somebody else. It was nobody. Come on, use your preaching voice. Nobody. Come on, holler at him if you can. Nobody. Nobody. Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me like the Lord. Won't he fix it? Won't he turn it around? Tell him thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know he's all right. Excuse me here. Excuse me a minute. I know we're running out of time, but I got so much to be grateful for. I got so much to be thankful for. He's answered my prayer. He's opened the door. He's healed my body. He saved my soul. I'm happy this morning. Why don't you hug somebody? Tell them whatever. Come on, use your preaching voice. What 